We're asking this of everybody. First things first, national question. Do you believe the election uh, for president was stolen illegally from President Trump? I am uh, committed to ensuring election integrity in Oregon, uh, that you can count, that, you're, that you can believe and know that your vote here counts, and that you can absolutely, absolutely guarantee that any fraud here is fully prosecuted and fully pursued. I talk to people about Oregon all day long, every day. And I believe that the vote in Oregon was accurate, that President Biden won the state of Oregon, and that, in fact, as House Republican leader, we picked up two seats on the North Coast. I was thrilled with that outcome. For the first time in a decade, we picked up seats in Oregon. And I will continue to uh, maintain my focus on Oregon politics and, and, and on the things that we, as Oregonians, care about right now. We have really significant challenges and problems, and the extent to which we can really talk among Oregonians about how to solve those problems will be the focus of my campaign. And the, and the reason for that has got to be that at some point, uh, Oregonians have got to expect that, that the people that are asking to lead them will focus on them and will focus on their challenges and what's going on around their kitchen tables. And so I have, uh, I have repeatedly tried to focus everything on what's going on here at home which is an excellent pivot, let me say. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, but it, it does seem like it's sort of a litmus test within the Republican groups, isn't it? Whether you believe that was stolen or not? Yeah, the Republicans that I have met with, they care deeply about the integrity of our elections, and I do too. That's what the core issue is. And when people lose confidence in our elections, you're basically losing confidence in our democratic republic. That's dangerous. We don't want that to happen. And when I was a state representative, I, I supported and sponsored legislation to ban ballot harvesting. Uh, I sponsored legislation which would have made redistricting the process we just went through uh, to put it in front of an independent redistricting commission. Because right now we all know that what came out of that process was politicians serving themselves and not the people. They guaranteed what the outcomes would be in, in races based from Congress to the state legislature based on how they drew those lines. That is a form of cheating. And I believe that kind of gerrymandering doesn't serve Oregonians. There are a lot of things about our elections that need to be reformed. Right now there's a bill in the legislature that they would allow people who have raped and murdered, felons serving time in prison, they want to allow them to vote while they are in prison. That is not right, and I stood against that, but against that legislation as well. Like what Republicans care about, I believe is what Democrats care about too, and that is that our elections are reliable, that every vote counts, that everyone who is eligible to vote has access to voting, and I've been a strong supporter of that. And, and that is the underlying question that we all need to keep our eye on. That's the issue we all need to address. So if I asked it a third time, would you answer or should we just move on? Well, it's your time. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough, we'll move on. What's the first thing you would tackle when you're sworn in? We have got to commit to keep our schools open full time and in person, and we've got to get politics out of the classroom. Now, as superintendent of public instruction, that's the governor's role. You have an immediate opportunity to affect outcomes inside the classroom. And right now, parents are seeing what's going on inside their kids' classrooms. They know what it's like for their kids inside schools right now, uh, behind masks and with kind of an, an approach to education, which we have a long ways to go to catch up for the learning loss from our shutdowns. And so job one, day one, is going to be to commit to parents that you are going to be engaged in this and that you are the person that knows best what your child needs and to ensure that they have an opportunity to engage. So, so a parent's advisory council in support of that work along with working with the Oregon, the school board itself is going to be a first step towards that. But um, I also proposed a piece of legislation which would have made the superintendent of public instruction a nonpartisan elected position. And I think that that's the best way to have direct accountability between our outcomes in our schools and families and students that they're there to serve. And right now, um, I will be thrilled to step into that role and take that responsibility of being the superintendent of public instruction, but I think it serves more Oregonians to have that role actually be duly elected and fully nonpartisan, and that would be the longer term goal. A additionally to that, um, the vaccine mandates would go under my administration. Uh, people should not have to be required to be vaccinated to be able to support their families, and that's an executive order that would go right away. 
And we have got to commit to support community safety. And that looks an awful lot like support for law enforcement and fully funding law enforcement and assuring our police officers that are doing their best to provide community service that they will be supported in that work. Okay, and we're gonna get there. Yeah. I just wanna go back to, um, just for folks who are watching, it sort of sounded like you were running for superintendent of public instruction instead of governor. It's the same job, actually. Governor of Oregon is the superintendent of public instruction in Oregon. And so the opportunity to direct schools is the responsibility of the governor. It is a dual title. But there literally is a post of superintendent, isn't no, it? No, there is not. It's the director of the Department of it's Education. It's the director of the Department of Education. It's an unelected bureaucrat that the governor appoints. The governor, uh, the governor herself, in this case, would be the superintendent of public instruction. And you feel that even with local school boards that the parents are not having enough input? Well, right now, I think what we've seen throughout this COVID experience has been the Oregon Health Authority and the Department of Education. I, have, I don't know if you've ever seen any of the rulemaking that schools have had to navigate, but you know, the binders and it's just a huge amount of regula regulatory direction to our schools. And school boards are doing their best to navigate, but that has been a tough road. And it hasn't just affected public schools, it's been all schools, private, charter, and public have all been under that, underneath those mandates. And that has tied the hands of a lot of local school boards as they move forward and try to be responsive to their own school districts and their parents in those school districts. And we need to return an awful lot of control back to the local governments, the local school boards again. And more than that, we need to, we need to recognize that that parents are the ones who are the strongest advocates for their kids, and we need to welcome their engagement. Okay. Uh, what about homelessness? Yeah. A lot of polls showing that is the number one issue for folks, certainly in the greater Portland area, mm -hmm. probably statewide. Yeah. You know, as I've been traveling the state, homelessness has been um, an issue in every corner of our state. I mean, that shouldn't surprise people, uh, but it is, in fact, uh, small towns, rural towns and Portland, everybody's facing it right now. You know, we have had a housing first approach to the homeless crisis for about a decade. I mean, since the Obama administration first introduced this concept of housing first. Um, and by that you mean having a place where people can be, can go. That homelessness is in fact a housing challenge. Okay. That was the that was the approach. People are on the street because there's because no Because they can't shelter. afford housing. Okay. Yeah. And so and so the approach has been to build more affordable housing to expand housing stock. We need to do that. That's part of the challenge. But it is not in fact the sole solution. It's kind of like hitting the easy button. It's a people problem. It's a, it's a it's a humanitarian crisis. And that has a whole lot more layers of complexity than just this simple question of, does somebody have a key to a tiny house uh, to get out of the cold? It's gotta be a part of the solution to have places for people to transition and live long-term. But we have got to address the challenges which are mental health, behavioral health, substance use, and of course the criminality that comes with some of the, some of the issues around substance use disorder. And in Oregon we have some of the worst numbers for addiction in the nation. And unfortunately along with that we have some of the, uh, the worst uh, access to recovery services. All of that contributes to what is in fact a very complex problem right now. And there's a lot of money being thrown at this problem, but we have not seen it actually affect outcomes. And when I have talked to folks, you know, uh, people on the, say, like East County side, um, they had a proposal and a solution around a homeless issue that was in a local park in a local community. And, you know, they connected with their, uh, with their sheriffs who have homeless outreach programs as well as community-based organizations. They had a plan. They said, we're going to, we are going to, uh, you know, deal with our local problem locally. And, and my understanding from that was that instead they had Metro come in and say, that's not how we're going to resolve this. Now that Metro has money and Metro is directing homelessness in the Metro area, um, they intervened and said, no, that's not going to be the solution here. The end result has been a lot of conversation, a lot of convening, no intervention. The people that were living in that park back in August are still living in the park in the, in the winter. And that lack of action takes leadership. The, the governor's office has the ability to, to take all these levels of bureaucracy and say this is an emergency. 
and we are we are going to work together. We are going to force progress on this issue, and it's got and it's got to be progress. It's got we have got to start to see progress on our streets. Local governments want to enforce local ordinances around safety. We need to let them do that. The legislature, uh, you know, following the court ruling, went too far. This was the court ruling that said you can't move people off the sidewalk again. if there's nowhere for them to go. Okay. And so you have to have you have to have adequate housing to be able to do that, a transitional housing to be able to do that. And and so you know, I represent I, I did represent a district that was kind of rural Clackamas County, and and um, and their solution from the legislature was uh, this idea that you're going to buy hotels and you're going to transition hotel rooms into homeless shelters. And their solution for my part of the metro area was to purchase the only hotel in Estacada that happens to sit on the Clackamas River, that happens to be a part of their long-term economic recovery for a community that was adversely impacted by wildfires and still doesn't have their highway open and Highway 224 that ha would have allowed rafters and campers to get up there and support that community, still shut down, but they have this hotel. They were going to come in and purchase that hotel and make it homeless shelters and homeless uh, a homeless shelter for, for people that are homeless in Portland. Now, there's one bus route a day that goes out to Estacada. There's no services out there. It was an intent to do some version of out of sight, out of mind. And it would have crushed the community and it would have taken away economic opportunity for them. It was not the right solution. Okay, but wait, there's no homeless in, living around the Estacada area? They absolutely have challenges with homelessness like everyone else, but not the extent that, they, that it would warrant purchasing the only hotel in town and that they had enough homeless to be housed in their own hotel. That's not the level of challenge. That, that would have been their solution for other communities homeless. And the community did what they should have done, and they opposed that proposal. You know, they said, they said we need this resource people who live here need to be able to have a hotel for guests. We need to have a place for people to come stay. It supports our economic vitality in the summer and, and throughout the year, and they need their hotel. And so it just, it was a solution from Salem that didn't actually fit the community. And, and had the community not stood up and said, this is a terrible fit for us, it would have been imposed on them. And so the approach to homelessness, I believe, needs to have more local engagement. And we need to be able to say, to allow local communities to be able to be a part of this conversation and, and not have this top-down approach to homelessness. I mean, if, we're, if we really look at how people, how people live and how people engage in their own communities, they want what's best for the people that are on the street but they also want their communities to feel safe. They don't want people rooting through their garbage. They don't want people leaving needles on their kids' path to school. Like, there, there is a way to navigate this where we both enforce community standards and we're compassionate towards people that are experiencing uh, a, a season of their life which no one would wish on anyone else, and they need help. But we cannot accept that as good enough for anybody. Um, okay, you said a lot there, in four or five minutes. Yeah. On, um, well, just as a fundamental question, would you, would you back or would you support forcibly moving people off of the street if there were shelters available and they chose not to go? Yeah, I think that you have to give people access to services and supports. And if at that point they make the choice not to, uh, not to take advantage of those services and supports, then you do need to remove them from the street. Um, the key to that is there has got to be access to transitional housing. There's got to be access to supports. And then if a person is making a decision to, um, to in fact continue a lifestyle which is dangerous to the community and is, it is not supportive of community health and community safety. And frankly, there's environmental degradation, which is extraordinary, that we wouldn't put up with if anyone else was engaging in that activity. Can you imagine if a business was dumping trash on the roadsides the way we see when we drive through communities? Um, the standards that we have for us need to be the standards that we offer to everybody. But first, you have got to make it clear that there are supports, there are services, there's transitional housing available. That's the first step. And after that point, uh, if, 
if people do not want to want to avail themselves of those opportunities, then absolutely we need to figure out a way to transition them um, so that our communities can be safe again. And do you think there's enough for affordable housing now or transitional housing? Yeah, I th well, we're on the path towards that. The legislature has uh, invested an extraordinary amount of money in recent years in housing. Uh, I, I'm remembering the numbers right, you know, it was close to a billion dollars all in for affordable housing plus some of the homeless supports. It's going to take time for that money to roll out. And the challenges around homelessness, it's been a long time coming to get us to this point. It's going to take a little bit of time to, um, to really provide supports. Uh, but we have got to begin to make progress. That's the thing, is we can't look at it and say it's too big and you know the challenge is too big and we're, our hands are tied by the courts and therefore we just have to look the other way. We can't enable this situation. We cannot enable the situation. It's not good enough for anybody. And, and the people that are living on the streets, that's somebody's son and daughter and uncle or whatever. You know, I mean, uh, we have got to look at our, at our fellow Oregonians with more, more compassion than would say, you just do you. That's just not good enough. There's no dignity in that. And do you think, as governor, would you put more money into mental health and oh, yeah. addiction recovery? And yeah, and I think that that's what Oregonians thought they were getting when they passed Measure 110. Yeah, which is uh, decriminalizes a lot of the mm -hmm. uh, yeah. drug possession. Yeah, and so you know the decision to decriminalize possession, I think, was a proactive decision to say we need more access to recovery services, and that measure needs to be fully funded and fully implemented. You know, we need to. We need to put additional supports into getting more workforce in that category, and uh, and fully support recovery services. It's going to be a, it's going to be a road back that might be long, uh, but we need but we have got to be more serious about taking the steps forward. Yeah, and the homeless, uh, you know, Bud Clark, who recently died, yeah. he was taught he had a ten year plan twenty years ago. Yeah, and I think Obama's plan was to end veteran homelessness in like three years, and end homelessness for women and children in like five. I mean. Uh, we're dealing with humanity. We're dealing with people that get to that have free will, that get to make their own choices. Um, not all choices that people make for themselves are healthy for the community. And we have got to approach this from the perspective of, okay, what are our community standards? Is there a compassionate approach to this, where we're providing for people that need help, want help, and are willing to accept help? And on the other side of it, recognize that we need to restore safe streets. We need for people to, you know, fly into Portland and recognize that it's the city of roses and it's a beautiful place to live and work and raise a family. And we are not there today. Um, okay, what about law and order? Portland in particular has had a real explosion of gun violence and murders. As governor, you're not in charge of Portland police, but what yeah. could you do for that? Yeah, you know, if if Portland leaders do not step in, specifically around riots, specifically around unrest that engages in property damage and, and criminal activity, if Portland leaders don't step in and resolve that, I, as governor, I will. Uh, you, we have got to get serious about public safety. And, and, it, and if the you know, DAs in Multnomah County will not enforce and charge when criminal activity has occurred, as governor, I will. Uh, governor, the governor of the state of Oregon is responsible to execute the laws of this state and has the ability to direct the attorney general in, in support of those laws, and I would do that. Uh, this whole idea that, that the charging and the you know, enforcement of the rule of law in Portland has become uneven has got to stop. Um, you know, people who have businesses that are deserved for their businesses not to be broken into. The people who are living there are living in fear because of the gun violence and the murder rate has, has gone up, has spiked like it has. We need, to, we need to support law enforcement. And so that means, you know, fully, fully staffing out state troopers, uh, fully backing up Portland police when they need it, ensuring that, uh, that the resources are there when the time comes and people, and people need that support. And that's been missing. Okay. So you'd bring in the state police if you needed to? Yeah, I would. How about climate change? Where are you at on that? Is yeah. it real? What do you think about it? You know, uh, climate uh, continues to be an issue that, uh, that requires a global response. It requires that we all do what we can where we are. 
and Oregon has been a leader on climate for many years. You know, we have a clean fuels program which is not yet fully implemented. And we have taken off our final, you know, coal coal-powered uh, electric plant in Boardman. Yeah, and we continue to make gains and progress in this category. It's important that as we uh, as we continue to advance these goals that Oregonians uh, care about and agree with, that we maintain access to one of really the uh, foundational um, supports that our economy has been based on, and that's access to hydropower. Hydropower is you know, carbon free, no emission, and it's baseline power that's affordable. Would you be against shutting down those dams on the lower snake? Absolutely opposed to that. Okay. Yeah, we have got to maintain baseline power, especially as we go uh, to more pressure on the electric grid for electric cars, electrification. Um, we, ha we cannot afford to abandon access to hydropower. Um, so, you know, that conversation is one I know that our current governor has been engaged in for a long time. I know it's a complex issue and a multi-state issue. Uh, but I would, I would be absolutely opposed to removing those dams. And I would support access, you know, to, um, to an all approach to our energy uh, grid, which means, you know, the extent to which we have small-scale nuclear here in Oregon for research. And, and the, pro the progress that's been made in that category is extraordinary. And I believe that, that the innovation that we're going to see in the future is going to allow us to meet our emissions goals and our emission standards, but we've got to get there at a time and in a way that we have access to affordable baseline power as well. And you know, solar wind can, needs to be a part of that and will continue to be a part of that. But uh, kind of it's so inconsistent that until we figure out the storage questions, we have got, we've got to protect uh, access to affordable, uh, accessible power. And I think right now uh, the state has a prohibition against any new natural gas mm -hmm. development. Would you keep yeah. that in place or would you change that? Yeah, I, I, do not, I do not support abandoning natural gas. We're moving towards renewable natural gas. And I think that that, in fact, is that next uh, tra uh, transition point. And to, to abandon that infrastructure and abandon access to that, I think, is short-sighted. OK. Um, and I think you're saying it in your answer, but just so that I tick my box, yeah. uh, do you believe that, that there is a problem with the climate, that the earth is getting warmer? Is that a real thing? Yeah, I, I do. Okay, excellent. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> For some reason, it's, uh, it still appears to be up to debate with some people. And so we're just asking that to get folks on the record. Um, Graduation rates, yeah, kind of low in Oregon kinda compared to low. the rest of the country. Yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, we, uh, it doesn't do our kids any favors to reduce graduation requirements just to kind of artificially bump our graduation rates. Doesn't do anybody any favors. I have a senior in high school. I've got a freshman in high school, and I can tell you that um, that the quality of education that they have been experiencing has recently uh, been lower than that of their oldest brother, you know, in schools. And, you know, when, when my oldest was hitting his senior year, he had an extraordinary workload. And he was preparing for the SATs and he was getting ready for the, you know, college and doing all those things. And, and my middle son is uh, transitioning along in his school, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. He's getting the credits. He's going to graduate no matter what. Mm -hmm. And the SAT wasn't required for him to be accepted into, into a school for next year. And just the level of rigor has softened. And, um, and that's just as a parent kind of watching throughout, throughout these times. My oldest is 20. Um, and so I can tell you that when he was in grade school, they had smaller class sizes than when his younger siblings were in the same school at the same age bracket. And so over time, um, our experience as a family uh, with education has been that instead of in increasing standards or holding standards or holding kids to higher standards, uh, they have in fact gotten uh, a little bit less rigorous. And I don't think that that serves Oregon kids long term. And, and it doesn't work it to check the box and say we're hitting those higher graduation rates when the statistics that we have for standardized testing for, um, for students of color is on par in some of those categories with homeless students. 
for what they're achieving and and what their future is going to look like uh, for how for how they are how they're being served in our schools right now. Our schools are in fact disproportionately underserving students of color in broad categories and have been for a long time. And um, and reducing graduation rates doesn't help that. And some of those conversations were about how these standard standardized tests that we were going to walk away from, um, you know, were. Uh, were in some way, shape, or form not serving students of color, and I would say that the real issue here is is the classroom setting helping them get up to those standards. Are we providing the supports that are needed to help all students succeed and help all students be prepared for their future? And I don't believe that we are. You know, I have been involved around education policy for a long time, and in the most recent legislative session, I sponsored a bill to fully fund schools. You know, $9.6 billion is a lot of money. And, and that was, you know, rejected by the, uh, by the majority in that setting. They were saying, oh, they have so much federal money. We have all of this new stuff. Schools were forced to wait for a new sales tax before they got the money that they needed to support CTE programs and additional programs for at-risk youth. They had to wait for a new tax to do that, despite the fact that our budget has doubled in a decade. Ten years of Democrat control of the House and the Senate, Democrat majorities in both chambers and a Democrat in the governor's office, doubled our state budget. And our, and our school's budget has just been limping along over the course of that time. And they had to wait until there was a massive tax passed to get money that they needed. That budgets express priorities. And our schools, in order to help our kids achieve standards, need to be able to have supports, to be able to provide interventions, and support the students and meet the students where they are and get them up to, st up to grade level, up to standards, to be able to compete not just with other kids that graduate in Oregon, but nationally and internationally. That's got to be the goal we have for our state and for our, and for our systems. Okay. I can tell that's an area of <laughs> expertise and passion that you have. That yeah. Um, the legislature has become somewhat divisive in recent years. I don't know if you're aware, but Republicans walked out, for example. Uh, if elected, how would you be able to form, you know, cooperation and work together? Yeah. Over the course of the um, time that I was House Republican leader, we had, you know, um, strong professional relationships across the aisle. We had policy differences, and there certainly was a power imbalance. And that power imbalance um, led to uh, led to the need to do everything we could. Uh, to fight back against policies that we believe very strongly would harm Oregonians, you know, whether it was the price of gas, the cost, of, the cost that it would take for somebody to turn on the heat in their home in the winter, those were very big issues for Oregonians, and we did everything we could to balance the scales. You know, being a being a Republican governor, first Republican governor in you know 35 years since someone sat in that seat, it would provide the opportunity to. Uh, to work across the aisle by just the necessity of how our process works. And the building is based on relationships, and I, uh, I really appreciate the relationships that I built and established with Democrats inside that building. And also, to pass legislation, you have to get the governor's signature. To pass your budgets, you need to, not, you need to avoid a line item veto. And that creates opportunity for collaboration. It creates opportunity for real compromise. And right now, with Democrats in charge of both chambers and Democrats in charge of the governor's office, you don't get that kind of compromise. It doesn't force those conversations. And I, I look at folks, uh, and the first thing, I always approach people with respect. No matter where you come from, no matter what your story is, no matter what your title is, I approach people with respect. And that is a strong foundation to build relationships on. And it's also a strong foundation to solve problems through. And, and, the, and the opportunity for accountability and balance in Salem, you're not going to get there unless you actually have someone from the opposing party to invite them to work a little harder to negotiate, to work a little bit harder to bring into that conversation more people that might otherwise be left out of that solution. Right now, some of the top-down solutions really leave out entire sections of our state or intentionally go out of their way to harm them in support of something else. It's kind of winners and losers. That happens a lot in Salem. And, and, as, and, or, and as Oregon's next governor, 
I would treat people in the, in the other side of the aisle with respect and also uh, demand some accountability for some of those policies and processes and welcome the opportunity to sit down and, and, and arrive at some compromise that serve more people. Was the uh, walkout a mistake? No, the walkout was absolutely essential. And uh, I say that uh, recognizing that I did not want to walk out. It's a very, it was a hard decision to make. It was not an easy decision. And I, after that, have to be accountable to everybody in my district and everybody else about why that decision was made. The bill that was proposed that year, that decision was made over a piece of legislation that would have absolutely harmed the state. It was the cap and trade. It was, it was a cap and trade bill that was being that was being advanced against uh, against the wishes of Oregonians. The request that we made was let Oregonians decide, add, create this, make it a ballot measure, send it out, let Oregonians decide. If they advance it and support it, that's fantastic. We understand, but that bill, that bill would have harmed the common school fund. That bill would have gutted you know, funding for roads. That bill was unconstitutional in how it was passed, and they cheated the process to move it through. We came to the point where no matter how many flaws that bill had, they were going to take California's cap and trade program and, and, and put it in place on top of Oregon's structure in a way that would have harmed far too many people to do anything but stop the conversation. And to be clear, we came back into the state and we said, you know what, cap and trade was the only bill that we were walking out over this session, and let's, let's finish up the session. And instead they made the decision if they couldn't have cap and trade, nobody was gonna get anything, and they gaveled out. And so, you know, everybody makes decisions over the course of uh, their public service, and that, and that was a difficult decision to make for our entire caucus. And uh, we made it based on a policy, uh, and not politics. The policy was that bad and the politics became that bad for how they were trying to ram it through. It didn't serve Oregonians. It was a political play that was more about a national agenda than it was about how that was gonna play out in our state. And, um, and it needed to be stopped. And in the meantime, the governor now through administrative rule has yeah. put a version of that in. If you become governor, would you undo a lot of that? I would, yeah. I think her executive order uh, was the wrong response that uh, that, that that the approach to climate is in fact a policy question and it's best placed in the hands of the legislature and um, and moving forward on that issue there's uh, there's endless opportunities every single session to come to compromise and to negotiate a better solution and the wrong decision was for the governor to step in and operate like she was another member of the legislature and say by executive order she's going to institute a whole new a whole new uh, climate scheme with, for, within the state of Oregon. So yeah, I would, I would not keep her executive orders in place on that. You sort of answered this already, but Oregon's uh, a blue state with a lot of deep red areas. Mm -hmm. um, how would you deal with two different uh, groups of population like that? I am a small town girl. I'm originally from Klamath Falls. And I've been living, you know, my life since college up in the metro area up here. And I, uh, I really appreciate the value and the importance of the suburbs and the urban core of our state. And, and I have, you know, lived my life with family and my upbringing in the rural parts of the state. I just, you know, I think I've mentioned this once before, the respect that I offer to people on the other side of the political aisle is the same respect that I would offer to Oregonians with all different lifestyles and all different kind of lived experiences, as they say. Um, the needs in the rural parts of, the, of our state cannot be overlooked. Like the rural-urban divide, from my perspective, is about opportunity and whether or not they have the opportunity given the resources that are available to them to be able to live where they've chosen and support their families and actually achieve financial stability and, and, still, be, and still be able to have the kind of cultural, cultural lifestyle that they choose. An urban lifestyle is not the same thing as somebody living in La Grande. And excuse me, and it shouldn't be. So, um, so I think the way that you bridge that 
is to actually be out in the communities and to see, to see what they need, to listen to their needs, and give more local control for them to be able to direct their own affairs. And, and I think that they have, to a great extent, had a lot of public policies forced on them uh, that's, har that are, that's harming the rural parts of our state. And it's taking an expectation for what we maybe can afford in the economy that Portland has and creating reg a regulatory environment and a tax environment that you can sustain with the kind of incomes and jobs that we've seen in the metro. But that is not sustainable in the rural parts of our state, and they are struggling. They're struggling for access to health care. They're struggling for access to pharmaceuticals. They're struggling for infrastructure supports. There's, I mean, you name it, they need help. They need, they need their communities to have less burden more support than what they've been getting. And I think that will go a long way in, in easing what, what I believe really is a true rural-urban divide. Uh, okay, just two other questions. One is Nicholas Kristof. you think he should be able to run? I think he should have to live here. I think he should have to buy your gas here and your bread and your milk, and you should have to try to get a job here to understand what problems Oregonians face. All right. Uh, the governor is considering commuting uh, juvenile sentences for people who are murderers and others. Do you support that? I'm wholly opposed to the governor's approach to commutations. She is uh, undermining uh, the will of voters when they pass Measure 11, and she is doing it based on a political agenda that is opposed to, um, to the whole idea that people would serve time in prison. I think she is harming victims. I think she is re-traumatizing the families of those victims, and her approach to these commutations has not followed the, uh, the processes that she should. I mean, we have early release programs, and those early release programs right now for people that are serving prison, because the bulk of folks that are behind bars will at some point re-enter society, and they need to be transitioned back into society at that time. Our existing processes for early release take into account Exact what's happened behind bars over the course of their, their, their time that they, that they have been adults in custody, or youth in custody in this case. And it takes into consideration good behavior, the voices of victims, input from DAs. There's an entire process, you know, whether or not they have housing lined up, employment, all of those things. The governor's commutation process sidestepped all of it. And it sidestepped all of it in a way that was very, very harmful, and I think misguided. Uh, to victims and their families and community safety overall. So, you know, we're talking, especially in the youth category, about youth who have harmed other youth. I mean, sexual assault and rape and murder and primarily kids against other kids. And, and to look at that, that category and say that I'm going to upend the system is a whole different level of harm. And I couldn't be more opposed to it. Okay. Uh, bonus question, sorry, because yeah. that was two. Um, uh, there's just been a ruling from the Secretary of State's office on campaign finance reform. Mm -hmm. How do you yeah. come down on that? Do you support limits on uh, donations? I think, if, I think if we can come to campaign finance reform that's fair and doesn't intentionally create winners and losers for who can actually participate. Okay, I don't understand what that means. So, to be, to be really clear, we've had, um, in the legislative process, we've had proposals that say this is, we're going to reform campaigns, campaign spending in Oregon. Okay. But those proposals have said that this kind of money is acceptable and this kind of money is unacceptable. So if you're a union, you could give unlimited because you get your money out of dues and those are all people. But if you're a business, you're excluded because you get your money from a corporation and that's somehow not okay. So I think that if we're talking about a fair approach to campaign finance limits, that you, that you create a limit that allows people to actually be able to run a campaign without handing off the responsibility for your campaign to really dark money, where third parties have unlimited access to spending but candidates don't. And when that happens, uh, which actually Oregon had campaign finance limits, I don't remember, I don't know if you remember this, but it was around 19, 96, Oregon had campaign finance limits. Candidates could raise 50 bucks or 100 bucks from individuals. Okay. And it meant that candidates could never raise enough money to run a race that they could fully control. 
it takes a lot of money to communicate. It just does. And if you want to be able to communicate your own message, you need to be able to raise enough money to do that. And at that time, I mean, those limits were thrown out. But at that time, it meant third party folks were getting involved in engaging in races. And candidates didn't have any control about how they talked to voters. I don't think that's healthy. I don't think it's good for our, our process. I don't think it's good for voters. Um, so I absolutely would uh, be willing to consider campaign finance limits if they uh, were fair, even-handed across, you know, across the board, and w that the limits were high enough for what donations could be, that the candidate could maintain control over how they communicate with voters, and it didn't push everything, you know, into like a black box that nobody knows who's paying for these messages, and that that is how uh, campaigns are run. I I think there has got to be transparency. Our current system is 100% transparent, and. And I think that's positive. You know where the money comes from. You know how the money's spent. And that has got to remain. Anything that, uh, that creates a system that pushes it out into the darkness it isn't healthy. So something like $1,000 per person or $2,500 per person and maybe yeah. 10000 for a corporation? or Some version that lets you, uh, lets you run your own race. Because, yeah, a, a race for governor probably is what, three million or It's gonna be six expensive. Or, yeah. yeah. Well just because it's a big state, a lot of media markets, you know, and it just you to be able to communicate your own message and introduce yourself uh, in a way that people actually feel like they get to know you. It takes time and it takes effort and it takes money to do that. And so there's no way around that. I don't support public financing of campaigns. I don't think public tax dollars should be used. To, uh, to support politicians, period. I think tax dollars are, should be core functions of government, schools, human services, safety net, public safety, uh, and that I, I don't support proposals that would use tax dollars to fund campaigns. So I would, I would support limits that were reasonable to allow people to raise their own money and continue with their own message and, uh, and, and keep the campaigns out of the dark black box of third party expenditures. Uh, that was pretty much what I wanted to cover. Do you have any else, any, anything else you were hoping to be asked or wanted to get in? I don't think so. I feel like that was, I think that was, you know, like a nice broad range of issues. Hopefully this won't be the last time we talk. Yeah, yeah.